100 years ago, 10 decades, three or four generations. Seems like a long time ago. Looking at it from another perspective, our grandmothers or great-grandmothers lived during these times. Our mothers and our grandmothers couldn't open a bank account or get a credit card without their husband's signatures. Not that long ago, women couldn't sit on a jury or run in a marathon. While women have gained so much in the last 100 years, the drive towards equality continues. There's still much to be done and many injustices to be rectified. Misogyny, racism, and discrimination continue to plague our society. Women, as always, are at the forefront of this fight. Suffrage history proves that change can be made by the people and that it helps to put women in charge. This is the story of the road to the 19th Amendment and the fight for voting rights that continues to this day. I'm sure you've heard the name Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In 1840, she and Lucretia Mott traveled to London for the World Anti-Slavery Convention. But when they got there, they were barred from joining the proceedings. And why? Because they were women. Undeterred, Stanton and Mott returned to the U.S. with plans to organize a convention for women in the United States. Eight years later, the first ever women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. Highlighting the event was Stanton's manifesto, the Declaration of Sentiments, from which decades of women's activism would be drawn. An interesting point of debate at the convention was whether or not women's voting rights should be a part of the document. People may not realize that many women actually argued against it. It actually took a man, the well-known abolitionist Frederick Douglass, whose powerful support of women's suffrage led to its inclusion. Another major focus of activists like Stanton and Mott was property rights for women. Until 1849, only white men were allowed to own property. In that year, just after Stanton's manifesto, a major victory was achieved when women's property rights were written into the California State Constitution. Women's rights conventions continue to be held annually, including one in Akron, Ohio, where abolitionist and advocate Sojourner Truth, a former slave, gave her famous, ain't I a woman? speech. She said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, then these women together ought to be able to turn it back. And now they's asking to do it. The men better let them. Because married women lacked property rights and weren't allowed to make contracts in their own behalf, it was common for progressive women in the mid 19th century to remain single. One such woman was suffragist Susan B. Anthony. You've probably heard of her too. The Civil War brought a pause to the suffragist movement, but once it was over, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton formed the American Equal Rights Association, an organization dedicated to the goal of suffrage for all, regardless of gender or race. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 as part of post-war reconstruction, defined citizens and voters exclusively as male. There was a lot of disagreement within the American Equal Rights Association over this and the proposed 15th Amendment, which would enfranchise black men while avoiding the question of women's suffrage entirely. Because of these disagreements, the group split More conservative activists such as Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe formed the American Women's Suffrage Association. Their goal was to work for women's suffrage through amending individual state constitutions. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Kitty Stanton and Susan B. Anthony founded the more radical National Women's Suffrage Association to achieve the vote through a constitutional amendment. In 1870, When the 15th Amendment passed, granting black men the right to vote, this group of suffragists actually refused to work for its ratification due to its exclusion of women. Frederick Douglass broke ties with Stanton and Anthony over their position. Instead, 
the group advocated for a 16th Amendment, which would grant universal suffrage. But this didn't come to pass. Into the 1870s, the suffragists were still up against a society and a government that did not want to give them voting rights. There was even a whole party, the anti-suffrage party, established against them. But there was one win. In Oregon, activist Abigail Scott Dunaway convinced lawmakers to pass laws granting a married woman more rights, such as starting and operating her own business, controlling the money she earns, and the right to protect her property if her husband leaves. It was just one state, but it was a big step. In 1878, an amendment for women's suffrage was proposed in Congress. The time still wasn't right, and it was defeated. It would take 41 more years for women's suffrage to become law. When the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, it was worded exactly the same as the 1878 Amendment. In 1890, the previously at odds National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association merged and joined names. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was its first president. The newly formed National American Women's Suffrage Association focused efforts on securing suffrage at the state level. There were some losses. The South Dakota Campaign for Women's Suffrage lost, but generally 1890 began a new period of progress for women. Women's roles were expanding, and the issue of suffrage for women became part of mainstream political discussion. There was state-by-state -state progress, too. Wyoming was admitted to the Union with a state constitution granting women's suffrage, and Colorado adopted women's suffrage in 1893. In 1895, Stanton published The Woman's Bible. It was a radical book in its support of women's rights, but also in its religious views. The National American Woman Suffrage Association moved to distance itself from her because a lot of the conservative suffragists considered her to be too radical and potentially damaging to the suffrage campaign. In 1896, the National Association of Colored Women was founded by Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, and Frances E. W. Harper, among others. If you haven't heard of them, you should have. This organization was founded in part because black women had been largely excluded from the ranks of the national suffrage organizations. With the motto, lifting as we climb, they were dedicated to the advancement of both women and African Americans rights, a fight that still exists today. And so does the organization they founded. Utah and Idaho adopted women's suffrage in 1896, but it took 14 more years for the next day to do so, and that was Washington. They kept pushing, even when lots of people were against them. They kept pushing by having a voting right parade in New York City. They kept pushing in California, where they finally get to vote in 1911. In 1915, there was another New York City parade, and this time, 40,000 supporters marched. Many women wore white and carried placards with the names of the states they represented, creating an iconic image in suffragist history. Even though several states still rejected women's suffrage, including New York, Woodrow Wilson said in 1916 that the Democratic Party platform would support suffrage. In that year, the first woman, Jeanette Rankin of Montana, was elected to the House of Representatives. A year later, in 1917, New York women finally gained voting rights. In 1917, the passing of the 19th Amendment was only three years away, and suffragists still had to push past huge barriers of discrimination, even more so for black and indigenous women. National Women's Party picketers appeared in front of the White House holding two banners. Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? And how long must women wait for liberty? <laughs> 
Picketers began to be arrested on charges of obstructing sidewalk traffic, and some were sentenced up to six months in jail. Living conditions were horrendous, with filthy water and bedding and worm-ridden food. They continued to protest, demanding to be treated as political prisoners and going on repeated hunger strikes. The leader of the National Women's Party, Alice Paul, was put in solitary confinement in the prison's mental ward as a way to undermine her credibility with the public. But nothing succeeded in silencing these brave women. So the superintendent of Occoquan Prison decided it was time to teach them a lesson. On the night of November 14th, 1917, guards dragged 33 newly arrested picketers into a dark, filthy cell where they were brutally assaulted. Hands were shackled, bodies slammed against iron beds, some lost consciousness, and one woman suffered a heart attack. As news of this mistreatment reached outside the prison, protesting and support increased until federal authorities finally released the prisoners. The DC Court of Appeals eventually ruled that the protesters were illegally arrested, convicted, and imprisoned. Within months, President Woodrow Wilson began calling on Congress to act on the Women's Suffrage Amendment. In 1918, Representative Rankin, again the first woman to be elected to Congress, opened a debate on a suffrage amendment in the House. The amendment passed, but it failed to win the required two-thirds majority in the Senate. Still, President Woodrow Wilson stated his support for a federal woman's suffrage amendment, and Michigan, South Dakota, and Oklahoma all adopted women's suffrage that year. The 19th Amendment finally passed in the Senate in 1919. It still had to pass the ratification process. It wasn't until August 1920 that the required three quarters of the state legislatures ratified the 19th Amendment. After decades of their tireless insistence, American women were finally granted the vote. Harry Byrne was a 24-year-old representative from East Tennessee who originally was not in favor of the 19th Amendment. But when it came time to vote, he reversed his decision. When he was asked why, he told the assembly that he felt that they had a moral and legal right to ratify. He also made no secret about his mother's influence. He said he believes that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow. And in this case, his mother wanted him to vote for ratification, which is exactly what he did. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Mrs. Byrne. The suffragist fight didn't end there. They should have granted suffrage for all women, but many states did everything they could to stop black women from voting. You might be thinking, how can that be? If the 15th Amendment stated the right to vote could not be denied due to race, and if the 19th Amendment stated the same for gender, how could a state pass laws denying any woman the right to vote? Southern states started requiring poll taxes and literacy tests. The official in charge had complete power over the literacy test questions and who passed and who didn't. The states instituted white primaries by determining that the political parties were private organizations and thus able to make their own rules about who voted in their primaries. None of these policies explicitly stated that black or indigenous people weren't allowed to vote but they were all designed to make it almost impossible. Indigenous women had been fighting alongside the suffragists for decades, but the 19th Amendment didn't grant them the right to vote either. Suffragist Gertrude Simmons Bonin of the Yankton Sioux Tribe, also known as Sitkalasha, created the Indian Welfare Committee through a grassroots women's club and tried to gain citizenship for indigenous people through gaining suffrage. It wasn't until the Snyder Act passed in 1924 that Indigenous people were granted American citizenship. How's that for irony? The qualifications for state citizenship, however, were determined by each individual state. And many states employed whatever tactics they could to disenfranchise Indigenous voters. The final state to grant full citizenship to American Indians 
was New Mexico in 1962. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama for refusing to give up her seat on the bus for a white man. She became the mother of the civil rights movement. People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true, Parks said. I was not physically tired, no more tired than I usually was at the end of a working day. I was not old, although some people have an image of me being old then. I was only 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. On March 7th, 1965, 600 activists set out on a peaceful march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery to protest the continued violations of African-Americans' civil rights. When they reached the Edmund Pettus Bridge over the Alabama River, hundreds of deputies and state troopers attacked them with tear gas, with nightsticks, and with electric cattle prods. The event, which the press dubbed Bloody Sunday, stunned and horrified the American public as it broadcast over television into their living rooms. A week after Bloody Sunday on March 15, 1965, President Johnson delivered a nationwide address in which he declared that all Americans must have the privileges of citizenship regardless of race. Johnson informed the nation that he was sending a new voting rights bill to Congress and he urged Congress to vote the bill into law. Congress complied and President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 on August 6th, 1965. The Voting Rights Act outlawed poll taxes, literacy tests, and other practices that had effectively prevented Southern Blacks from voting. It authorized the U.S. Attorney General to send federal officials to the South to register Black voters in the event that local registrars did not comply with the law. And it also authorized the federal government to supervise elections in districts that had disenfranchised African Americans. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 transformed patterns of power in the South. By the middle of 1966, over half a million Southern Black women and men had registered to vote. And by 1968, almost 400 Black people had been elected to office. Clearly the fight for voting rights continued long after 1920 when the 19th Amendment was passed, and it continues to this day. The story of the passage of the 19th Amendment is much more than a good history lesson. It's a testament to the persistence and power of the women behind the movement. Suffragists were focused on their goal and kept pushing forward until they could not be ignored. Fast forward 100 years, and today we have a woman of color running for vice president. Thank you.